Welcome back to another episode of The Review, hosted here on the Alaska Landmine. I'm your host, Kale Green, and today we're going to be talking about something I've been aching to discuss for months now, and this issue is probably the most important vote that any of us here in Alaska will cast on November 3rd. Today we're going to be talking about ranked choice voting, open primaries, and dark money. Let's get into this. Welcome to The Review. So to start, Ballot Measure 2 is a multifaceted initiative that deals entirely with electioneering. There are so many pieces to this bill that a complaint that it was too complicated was brought before the Alaska Supreme Court. And while the case was struck down, there are substantially more issues contained within this measure than Alaskans are used to. This bill is not the norm. This is the outlier. The 25-page initiative, called Alaska's Better Elections Initiative, is dozens of statutory changes in order to create eight separate broad changes to Alaska's election law, three of which we'll be diving into today. This is what it would do according to the bill. Prohibit the use of dark money by independent expenditure groups working to influence candidate elections in Alaska and require additional disclosure by these groups. Establish a nonpartisan and open top four primary election system. Change appointment procedures for certain election boards and watches in the Alaska Public Office Commissions. Establish a ranked choice general election system. Support an amendment to the United States Constitution to allow citizens to regulate money in elections. Repeal special runoff elections. Require certain notices in election pamphlets and polling places. And amend the definition of political party. The three main pieces of the initiative can be summarized as one increasing the transparency around dark money relating to candidate spending. While normally dark money is a nebulous campaign term and how I will believe it will be interpreted by most voters, the initiative defines it more specifically as a contribution whose source is not disclosed to the public. The initiative accomplishes this goal by increasing the regulatory hurdles required from independent expenditures for candidates who raise a large amount of their funding from out of state and or on individuals or groups who donate more than $2,000 to these independent expenditures. This includes how they're able to show their messages and how quickly they'll need to report those new contributions. Two, opening up Alaska's primary system. Right now, Alaska has two closed primary pathways to the general election ballot. Although to be fair, those aren't the only ways onto the ballot or into the seat. But as far as the party systems go, either you go up the Republican primary ballot or you try your luck at the substantially more open Alaska Democratic Alaskan Independence Ballot. This part of the initiative will change Alaska's voting system to be a nonpartisan open primary, or what some politicos refer to as the jungle primary. Welcome to the jungle. Where the top four vote getters advance to the general election. Three, changing Alaska's general election from a winner takes all system where the candidate with the most votes is elected, even if they receive a minority of votes cast in the first round, to a system of ranked choice voting, where voters can choose second and third and fourth choice candidates and the candidates with the fewest votes are successfully eliminated until of the remaining candidates, one is the preference of a majority of voters. It would work like this. The four candidates who got the most votes advance from the primary system to do battle in the general. When people go to vote, they rank their candidates from first favorite to last if they want to. When the four candidates' votes are tallied, whoever gets the fewest votes is eliminated, and their second choice votes are distributed to the remaining candidates in accordance with the numerical choice of the voter. If nobody wins, there it happens a second time to reveal the winner of the race. There are countless videos online with pretty pictures that highlight this better than I can, and I suggest watching any of them to understand how this works. Currently, the ranked choice voting system is used in 13 U.S. cities, including early adopter San Francisco. The state of Maine also passed ranked choice voting in 2016 and will hold their second federal election with it on November 3rd, which includes the elections of moderate Republican Susan Collins. Many countries around the world, including Scotland, Northern Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand, also use ranked choice voting. As of the November 3rd election in 2020, Alaska and Massachusetts are the only two states that will be voting on whether to adopt ranked choice voting. Now, while these issues have never been packaged together on the same ballot before, Alaska's had a long history with some of these issues. From 1947 till the first year after statehood, Alaska had blanket primaries. In a blanket primary, all the candidates run on a single primary ballot and the candidates from each party who received the most votes move forward as the party's nominee. Starting in 1960, we went to a single ballot open primary system until Hickel asked the legislature to go back to the old system in 67. And they did, so we had blanket primaries until 1992, when the Republican Party was tired of being on the same ballot as everyone else, and they wanted to be able to close their primaries, and they did for two cycles, 92, 94. Until they lost their case in the Alaska Supreme Court, they tried to argue that the blanket primaries violated their right to assemble, and the court didn't agree. 
until, because of the California case in 2000, the United States Supreme Court ruled 7-2 that blanket primaries did, in fact, violate the right to not associate, which led to emergency action and the subsequent passage of HB 193 in 2001, leading to the creation of six closed primaries. Meanwhile, outside of the legislative and judicial branches, an initiative got voted on during the primary election in 2002 that asked Alaskans whether they wanted to open their primary system back up again, along with an instant runoff voting system. This proposal looked a lot like ranked choice voting in Ballot Measure 2, only this system would have allowed for five instead of four candidates that could advance to the general election. And while I'm tempted to get into some of the more recent Alaska-based drama that's taken place since 2002, bringing the number of primaries from six down to two, we'll have to save that for another episode. This episode has to remain as focused on Ballot Measure 2. If you want to read more about Alaska's timeline and history with open primaries, read the full article I've written in the Alaska Landmine. This is all to say this stuff has been changing since before we were a state, and Alaska has had a long history with open primaries. Regardless, what I want to try to explain next is the strongest arguments from each side. Let's start with the strongest argument from Yes on 2. And bear with me here, I'm going to do my best to make this as visual and entertaining as possible. So, I am going to be the moderator. I'll be arguing yes on two, and I'll be no on two. Let's get right to the first argument from yes on two. Partisan orthodoxy is destructive. The systems of party controls we experience in America has been all-consuming, and Americans are fed up with it. Opening up the primary and creating a ranked choice voting system will allow more ideologically moderate candidates to gain traction in what feels like a hopelessly ultra-partisan landscape. This won't get rid of politically conservative or liberal ideology, but it will work to end the litmus test of numerous particular positions. The closed partisan primaries in Alaska receive such abysmally low turnout, it can hardly be argued that they represent the will of the people. We shouldn't be testing all candidates at that level because the system has created a two-party divide with significantly small overlap. A majority of voters are independent and not part of the party machine, and they deserve a voice. This system doesn't represent the people and it fails at making sure American values are upheld. We can simply point to the troubles happening nationally and realize that Alaska is not best served by Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi. Okay, interesting points. How about the rebuttal? The parties are important and this ballot measure significantly devalues them. This is a fundamentally Republican process. And by Republican, I mean as in form of government, not as in the Republican party. This type of system is consistent with the founders thinking for a couple of reasons. First, primary voters are likely to be more informed than participants during the general election. This creates a system where those who choose to participate in the partisan elections beforehand are acting on the party's behalf to create a system that is not direct democracy, which the founders were strongly against. The two-party system fundamentally started at the end of George Washington's administration, was all but guaranteed by the founders as part of a Newtonian system of checks and balances that they proposed during the formation of the Constitution. Bodies were to act as counter to other bodies, whether that be parties or branches of government, and the resulting conflict was to create a chimerical set of new ideas that would be the basis of our system of laws. The primaries aren't supposed to bring out the largest swath of the electorate. They're supposed to create a system of duopoly, of the top two most supported ideologies that struggle and with those sides needing something from the other, and that would yield in a compromise. The results best for the whole. A Super Bowl with two teams, not three. The struggle yields the best results when two sides concede to create something new. <sighs> yep, yeah, solid points, Kale. Let's hear yes on two's next argument. Ranked choice voting is a fairer system. By instituting the ranked choice system, you're gonna remove the spoiler effect and theoretically encourage broad-based appeal by enfranchising voter groups that have been historically disenfranchised. Spoiler effects, for those who don't know, is when a third party candidate siphons off enough votes so that somebody can win with less than 50% plus one of the vote. We've seen this historically with candidates like Ralph Nader. Our current system of plurality wins in the general, in which a candidate doesn't need to win by a majority of voters, but instead by a plurality of them, doesn't actually allow for majority rule. It creates a system where a candidate in a three-way race could win with 34% of the vote. The ranked choice system makes sure that each candidate who wins has 50% plus one of the vote. This theory posits that the candidate chosen will have to be responsible to a more diverse portion of the electorate. This perceived broadening of the political electorate will encourage candidates who have traditionally had a harder time getting elected to run, candidates with differing political positions or women, minority racial groups, or folks with lower socioeconomic status, we can look at the election turnout increases in cities and states that have adopted ranked choice voting and see that the trend is to increase voter turnout immediately after passage. Conversely, simply put, it's confusing. Tanks don't roll because of elections in America. They never have. They do in other places. And this, despite what proponents say, is more confusing. Period. Our system now makes a lot of sense. 
One person, one vote. Even if they don't win with 50% plus one of the vote, that rarely even happens in Alaska. In the 2018 elections, out of 52 races, three candidates won with less than 50% of the vote in their race. In 2016, the number was the same. That only applied to three candidates. And to be fair, one third of those races involved Dustin Darden in District 22. It feels like a straw man argument to get folks to buy into something that's untested and unproven. If our system now is the most simple, this system, being in any way more complicated, is more confusing to voters. While the Democratic primary results in Iowa are not 100% analogous to the outcome, it's easy to understand. Bernie Sanders claimed he won because he had the most votes, but Pete Buttigieg was eventually given the victory, much to the confusion of Democrats nationwide. This is taking a system that works and works well, and it's distorting it to try to change the outcome without knowing what type of outcome it could possibly have. In a recent article from ethnicmediaservices.org, Jason McDaniel, associate professor of political science at San Francisco State University, says that he believes the system could lead to a disparity in voting. It advantages higher education voters and older voters who are used to the process. The complexity is a barrier, not an insurmountable barrier, but a barrier nonetheless. Simply put, don't let anyone tell you that this system will have a certain outcome because we don't know yet. The science is still out, and it should be. Only one state has adopted this four years ago. Now, away from the arguments about voting, we've come to Yes on Two's last major argument now about the impact of dark money on elections. And again, through all of this, I want to state that I'm just trying to articulate their positions. That doesn't mean that these are mine. So let's talk about dark money. Dark money has had a corrosive impact on elections in Alaska. Dark money has bought elections in Alaska before and often voters are unaware of where that money is coming from. Citizens United was a bad decision and money isn't free speech. By reforming dark money that's spent on elections that get candidates elected in Alaska, we're leveling the playing field and allowing people to have a voice and not get drowned out by special interest groups from in or out of state that want to control the outcome of Alaska elections. Citizens United has nothing in it that protects people's ability to give anonymously. This initiative would be seen as the most we could do to make their donations now actually transparent. Too often organizations work to shield the rich from having to disclose their identity when it comes to spending. We're not saying you can't spend money, we're saying people have to know exactly who you are when you do. Now, I'm probably not gonna spend much more time talking about their side for dark money because I think it's a winner at the polls. Getting dark money out of politics has been the promise of every election reform since I've been alive. If this issue ended up being voted on individually without the other pieces of the ballot measure, I imagine that it would win 75% of the people being for it and 25% people being 25 of the people being against it, if not at a higher margin. So now let's break down the opposing rebuttal. Money is free speech and this could have a chilling effect. The most ironic part of the Yes on Two campaign is that it's actually funded by what most people would think of as dark money from outside interest. What is dark money, especially as people understand it colloquially? Is it dark money or is it freedom of speech? The Citizens United case of 2008 that ruled 5-4 that money could be speech is the law of the land. It came about because people tried to get money out of politics and it's not possible. How many times have we reinvented the wheel on this one? Somehow the money is always spent by rich people. Let's talk a hypothetical here. If Mark Zuckerberg moved to Alaska and wanted to run for governor, who could stop him? Not Baggage, not Dunleavy, not Lisa Murkowski. No one could stand up to the Facebook money machine. Well, let's say in this scenario, Elon Musk was mad at Zuckerberg and wanted to put up his money against him. Cause I don't know, maybe Zuckerberg crashed one of his future satellites into Musk's self-driving semi-manufacturing plants. Not cool. But anyway, Musk would have a difficult time creating a group in Alaska because of the extreme reporting requirements, which changed some deadlines from 10 days to 24 hours. There were also increases to regulations regarding the way you can present advertisements. Let's say, for example, you bought a 30 second commercial. A paid for buy disclosure would need to be shown the entire time, not just at the end, like is required now, like a skull and crossbones on a pack of cigarettes, which could be a deterrent. And I want to remind you that right now, the amount of time out of a 30 second ad that needs to be dedicated to that disclosure is probably about one fourth of the time to begin with. If we believe the highest law of the land, in this case, Citizens United, and say that free speech is money, this could, in time, easily be argued to have a chilling effect on our ability to exercise our rights. And now, this brings me to the final argument from the no side. Outside interests are funding the Yes campaign. The Yes campaign is being financed by outside groups. A lion's share of the funding, 98% or a large majority, is from out-of-state special interests who view Alaska as a cheap date. 
Outside interests are trying to make us their testing ground for an experiment democracy, and Alaskans don't get bought so easily by outsiders. It's true, the Yes campaign is out of state money. Some Alaskans have donated, but it's not a significant enough portion to matter. The Alaskans who have donated are mostly just friends with the people organizing it here locally or work at the boardroom. Millions of dollars have poured into the state by trying to buy Alaska's election. This thing is as outside as it gets. And what's better, even if this did pass, this wouldn't end the dark money spending like they claim it will. The dark money provisions don't apply to initiatives like this one. They don't apply to federal races either because the state doesn't regulate those. The state is APOC. The federal government has the FEC or Federal Election Commission. So if this passed two years ago, hypothetically, all the money from Sullivan, Gross, No on One, Yes on Two, they'd still be here. The Yes campaign is just salty from the 2018 election results and are taking money from wherever they can get it to try to sneak a fast one in on Alaskans. And now, a counter to that argument from Yes on Two. Ballot Measure 2 is chaired by, ran by, and supported by Alaskans. The money coming in from outside is nice, but Alaskans have also donated this thing. Money comes in all the time for U.S. Senate races. In fact, it would be impossible to imagine running a modern federal race without a majority of money coming in from outside, whether that was in the form of super PAC money or individual donations to the campaign. In fact, a large portion of the money that came in to our elect our current governor came in from out of state. The idea that this movement is an Alaskan because a portion of our money comes from out of state is an attempt to distract you from the issues. The truth is, our opponents are afraid to talk about anything else because they know when it comes to the arguments, theirs fall short. People are fed up for all the reasons we've listed, and they're arguing that the rules aren't fair when they serve it as, an, as an example as to why we need them to be stricter. They openly flaunted their wrongdoing and violated even the most basic law of disclosure and tried to pull a fast one on Alaskan voters. This is a laughable claim to say that we aren't playing by the rules when they were the ones who got slapped down by an APOC for breaking the law. When you're done complaining about the money, we've successfully raised and how poorly you've done by comparison, maybe you could tell Alaskans why you want to continue to block any real choices they have so you can keep your ideological duopoly, denying the Alaskan people a real choice. Okay, fun as that was, and it was, and now that I've argued both sides, I want to be clear, I'm not sure how I'm voting. I'm largely doing this episode of the review in the hopes that by thoroughly researching this issue, I can figure it out for myself. But I do think that the yes side is going to win. In fact, I'm sure they're going to win. If a person wanted to bet me, I've got $300 on it. But only one person I can't be in $300 bets with everyone who watches the review. I've come to this conclusion, though, for two reasons. First, I've been watching polling, talking with politicos and regular people, and at this point, I also just have a gut feeling about it. Months ago, I figured that Yes on Two had the stronger, more campaignable issues from the beginning. Their topics hit on a more populous note during the election with the largest turnout. Seems like a no-brainer. People are fed up with partisan politics, and this may or may not be the answer, but people are ready to do something about it regardless. People are fed up with Congress, and they're fed up with the legislature not getting stuff done in Juneau and sessions consistently going on way past 90 days. I don't think anyone can make the case today that we even have a citizen legislature. I don't know how anyone could hold down a job and be in Juneau for six plus months a year. Secondly, the no campaign's performance has been, well, bad. They've not only made a couple of unforced errors, they've also presented weaker arguments to audiences who are already voting their way. And finally, they just took too long to mount any reasonable opposition. Their campaign material is going out now, and a lot of ballots have already been cast. From my understanding, it's moderates and moderate left voters who will carry this thing over the finish line. So it would stand to reason that the no campaign should have focused their energy there. They should have talked about how Mark Baggage and Planned Parenthood opposed this thing. They should have engaged with voters on the left and reminded them about the failures in Iowa, the Democratic caucus, and stoked their fears about a Trump election that would be unclear and that would potentially allow them to steal the presidency. They also had the ability to try to encourage their base, likely a more Republican group right now, to vote against this thing as a vote against Lisa Murkowski. Right, wrong, or indifferent, many Republicans are not happy with Lisa. It's not a secret. Had the folks at No One Two wanted a winning message to convince their base about this, they would have just said that this is Lisa's backdoor to winning the Senate in two years. But instead, the No campaign has spent all of their time conflating issues that have nothing to do with the initiative. I've been watching the public appearances by folks at No One Two and getting all the email blasts, and I'm not sure if the No campaign knows how to reach out to folks outside of more conservative circles with their messages. Here's one of the group's Facebook posts, where they claim that homelessness is related to ranked choice voting being implemented. While they were at it, they should have just said that theft went up and infant mortality went up or that since 2004 Barack Obama was elected or anything else that has nothing to do with ranked choice voting. And all their other time, they've spent arguing about the money that the Yes campaign has received and all of it being from out of state. Don't get me wrong, for a lot of folks, that's convincing enough a message. And honestly, if they had the money, it might be enough all on its own. 
but at some point, most people want an argument that's a little more substantive. I'm not sure if it's possible, if I'm being fair here. From what I'm able to tell, it looks like the Yes campaign is at somewhere around 13 times more financing than the No side, which by all metrics should be considered a blowout. If the Yes side lost at this point, it would be extremely embarrassing. The difference in the amount raised by the two campaigns all but assures a victory, and hardly is a hard-fought campaign. That makes sense because I've been confused by the yes vote tactics nearly as much as the no. Maybe I'm not being targeted, yet I've seen the ads, all the ones they've sponsored to me, and I've watched all the content they put out onto platforms I can monitor. But if I'm being totally honest, I don't think anyone knows what this thing is. And maybe that was their goal, was never to try to explain it from the beginning to most voters. The Yes folks have held many in-depth town hall-like discussions with very academic folks. I found that their attendance is never high, but those in attendance seem to be highly informed, more moderate voters. I don't think most people have any idea what this thing is. They have sound bites like this, and yet they're not blasting it to moderate Republicans. I'm not against ranked choice voting. I think it's a clever idea. Uh, and, and I agree with you that it would actually embolden people to vote for third parties more often, which frankly, I think would be a good thing. More choices are, are better in American politics. And the two-party system has basically resulted in a long-standing agreement that nobody will ever take tough positions about anything related to spending or anything politically unpalatable, Joel. So They're focused on talking about high-minded rhetoric that seems to engage with a facet of the electorate. And again, I think they're going to win. Facebook doesn't win campaigns, but even if so, they've spent more than $166,000 on their Facebook presence since July 1st, and they've been able to get 2.7 thousand likes on their page. Their highest video ad was this one of Eric Reed. Now, if they've only spent $166,000 on Facebook, I'm gonna assume their reach on TV and YouTube and other platforms is quite extensive. Even if it's only seemed like a little bit of engagement with the public practically, it's more than the no campaign has gotten. But I think that most people will probably see the measure for the first time in the ballot box. And the language seems to favor a yes vote on first pass. The act, as a voter will read this, starts with doing away with the primary's party system. Remember, most people don't participate in those. This is going to give most people, in their minds, a new choice they didn't previously have. That alone would probably be enough. For folks who have heard a little something, they probably just heard that this is a solution to partisanship, and that alone would get their vote. How many times have you heard non-politicals say, I vote for the person, not the party? From a campaign perspective alone, I'm having a hard time imagining yes, losing. At the end of the day, we need to ask what the goal of this thing really is. It's not a secret amongst political circles what it is. It's a lever being pulled for a few reasons. There are probably three things that shape this more than anything else. One, the 2018 gubernatorial election. Two, Jason Gren's 2018 election. And three, Lisa Murkowski's 2022 election. Because I've made such a deep dive into this topic already, and I don't want to spend eternity talking about this issue, but I do want to touch on each of these briefly to explain why I think it's happening. First, a majority of folks at the yes side were part of Governor Walker's organization or team. The 2018 election saw the introduction of an independent expenditure for Governor Mike Dunleavy that did a lot of heavy lifting for the official campaign. Full disclosure, I worked on that independent expenditure. Many of the dark ad provisions in this seemed aimed at curtailing that type of campaigning, the stuff that happened in 2018. The dark money provision would go a long way toward fixing that issue in their eyes. Secondly, Jason Gren's 2018 and 2016 election saw what was probably a spoiler in the race. His race versus Sarah Rasmussen was not a one-to-one. -one. Full disclosure, I've done videos for Sarah's 2018 and 2020 race. Perennial candidate Dustin Darden was also in the 2018 race as a Democrat. Jason Grand was an independent and stuck in the middle. Even the incumbent advantage wasn't enough. He ended up losing to Rasmussen, even though she did not have a majority of the votes. Most likely, Darden pulled votes from Gren and cost him the 2018 election. Funny enough, Darden likely pulled votes in 2016 when he ran under the Alaska Independence Party banner and gave Gren the seat to start with. Ranked choice voting might fix that in either direction. This could, in their eyes, end the spoiler effect. And lastly, third, maybe the most impactful consequence of the passage of Ballot Measure 2 is the pathway to victory it opens up for Lisa Murkowski. Full disclosure, my first campaign internship was with Lisa Murkowski in 2010. I worked for a campaign in 2016, and I also just like Lisa Murkowski. Right now, with Lisa's numbers in a Republican primary, I'm having a really hard time imagining her being able to run through the gauntlet of a Republican primary again. I think that there would be a lot of potential ways to get knocked out going in that direction. If she can't easily win a Republican primary, she either has to run as a petition or as an independent in the Alaska Democratic Party Independence Party ballot. Both options present serious problems. 
unless ballot measure two passes. If ballot measure two passes, I see Senator Murkowski, who is largely favorable amongst moderates on both sides of the spectrum, having a clear pathway to victory, or at least substantially more clear than if she ran other system we have now. Okay, holy shit, what a dive. Clearly, I've been wanting to talk about this for months, and I'm not sure if this is going to be cut into one episode or two, but thank you for the small handful of you that made it this far. At the end of this breakdown, after the history and arguments for each side, I think it all really comes down to this. If you like how elections are right now, if you think the current system is fair, vote no. If you don't, vote yes. We don't know exactly what the implications of a yes vote are yet. We won't really fully understand the full consequences for years to come. It'll take a while for politicos to figure out how to play this new game. But regardless of what you think, it will be different. It will change things. And if you want that, vote yes. If you like the litmus test that special interest, including Planned Parenthood or the NRA, can exert into the party's primary, this isn't for you. This will separate out issues from parties and ask people to be a little bit more informed than they are now. That doesn't mean it would be this way forever. If the history of Alaska's primary elections has shown us anything, it's that this can and will change. If the ballot measure passed, the legislature cannot alter it for two years. But after that, they can do whatever they want. If the 2022 election is the worst thing ever, the legislature can throw it out. Thanks for joining on the longest episode of the review and maybe our last one before the election is over. If I don't post anything between now and then, it's been awesome talking about issues and I look forward to talking to you again on election night during the election night coverage being hosted by the Alaska Landline. If you like this episode, please hit like or if you felt like I didn't cover everything, comment below. I'll be happy to chat with anyone about this thing. See you next time and good luck deciding how you're going to vote on this.